Project people, you're listening to the Project Chatter podcast, your trusted source of project experts. I'm your host, Val Matthews, and I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Dale Fung. Hello, Val. Another amazing week. I'm excited to be here. I always say I'm excited, but it's amazing. We are so lucky to speak to guests, different guests, every week on a different topic. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm envious of myself. Is that a thing? It could be. It is now. Uh, but uh, I need to stay on track. So let me get back on track. Um, just to remind us to our listeners, the subscribe button on whichever platform you listen to your good podcasts on or our YouTube channel. If you'd like to view your podcasts and if you'd like to sponsor the podcast, you can get in touch with us via our website. Check out projectchatterpodcast.com. Now in this pod, we are joined by Gary Wong and Hendrik Lawrence to talk about Adaptive project management and how it improves project delivery. Hi, Gary. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Val. Glad to be here. Exciting. And Hendrik, welcome to the show, mate. Hello, Val. Hi, Dale. Great to be here. It's, it, no, as Dale said at the start, it's our pleasure to have new and exciting guests. Um, and before we get into it, let's let's check out your bios, Dale. Thanks, Val. And I'm excited. I think especially excited because I have another South African accent on the podcast today in Hendrix. So, <laughs> so I'm going to start with Hendrick's bio. It's an amazing bio. So Hendrick Lawrence is the owner of Stratflow, a company that provides solutions to project focused companies that are looking to mitigate risk and to deliver immediate and significant results. He helps his clients to achieve breakthrough performance by clarifying the inherent simplicity in complicated and pressured environments and focusing their effort on the few critical leverage points that affect their system. Hendrik is a physicist by training with advanced qualifications in polymer science, accreditation in theory of constraints, uh, constraints, which includes critical chain project management, finance operations and supply chain and thinking processes, as well as an MBA. Hendrik has worked as, at director level in manufacturing businesses for a number of tier one companies. He has worked with companies such as Horizon, Qantas, John Holland, CPD, CPB, sorry, Downer, BHP, and Anglo-American, and published widely on productivity, digitization, and social license. Amazing. So moving on to Gary. Gary lives in Vancouver, Canada, a great part of the world I haven't been to, but I know a lot of people from there, and I hear good things, Gary. Gary has over 45 years of experience, starting with his career in an electrical utility where he worked in engineering, line operations, business consulting, and training roles. PM responsibilities included managing electric utility construction and maintenance projects, and running a PMO for business process re-engineering initiatives. He later joined Ernest & Young Consulting, now Capgemini, Capgemini Consulting, as a senior manager in strategy and transformation. Gary has operated his own independent consulting practice over the past 15 years, focusing on complexity thinking and safety. He is a training associate with Cognitive Edge Inc. and co-authors and delivers complexity courses and workshops. Gary has an engineering degree from UBC and an MBA from SFU. He also has held roles as a certified Franklin Covey Seven Habits facilitator and an Edward de Bono Six Thinking Hats and Lateral Thinking instructor. Gary, I think that last sentence really got Val all perked up. Um, he just had this massive smile on his face. He loves that stuff. Seven Habits, a huge Draw. fan. De Bono as well. Such, such, such great um, techniques to use and we'll get into some of those but welcome to both of you it's fantastic to have you both on the podcast uh, we've got Hendrik you joining us today from Sydney Australia correct. yeah that's correct yeah how's it going that side of the pond at the moment pretty good uh, I mean we we've got lots to be thankful for we can move around pretty much as we like uh, so uh, yeah very good very good place to be awesome awesome and as we heard Gary, you are in Vancouver, Canada. What's it like there at the moment? Well, we just kind of had a bit of reopening. 
uh, we did well over Victoria Day where the, um, the, the numbers were, were still down. But of course, we're still doing all our safety precautions, making sure that we don't get hit with a fourth wave. Yeah. And hopefully by then, the, you know, the forecasting and here we are project management, people are forecasting. <laughs> we're forecasting maybe by September, we'll all be kind of like back to where we were a couple of years ago. Well, we'll see how the world unfolds, right? Yeah, it's a complex world we're living in right now. So let's <laughs> let's get into it. So before we jump into the topic today, so you two gentlemen know each other, obviously. Mm-hmm. Who's better placed? We'll get we'll get each of your view actually into how you your paths crossed um, and what brought you together um, on the journey today. So let's start with yourself, Hendrik. Yeah. So. Um, uh, 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 difficult to think how long ago I think it was probably around 2011 or 2012 so at that stage Mm -hmm. I had just completed uh, training in all the areas of theory of constraints it was sort of a very novel thing to 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 learn theory of constraints and all the different um, subdivisions within a year year and a half and um I was working with a, I think, uh, one of the leading experts in theory of constraints in mining, and um, he developed some systems during the years uh, that had absolutely tremendous impact in a very, very quick, uh, very short period of time using theory of constraints, but uh, also bringing in other uh, humanistic aspects, you know, because in the end, it doesn't matter how good the theory is, people have to implement it. And um, I started writing some articles and I had become aware of uh, complexity science. And I've always been aware that, you know, uh, the theory of constraints had some really, really great uh, uh, areas to it and some really great results, but there was something extra that was required. And as time went by, I started to realize it's the uncertain, it's the, it's the curveballs, it's the things that you don't expect. Um, and uh, there was this company called uh, Kenevan uh, that uh, started talking about that. And Gary was, I saw Gary was associated. So I sent an article off to Gary and Gary made some pretty insightful comments. And I thought, well, this is very interesting. And um, so, so we made contact and the conversation started from there. And uh, Gary actually also uh, introduced me to the world of safety which, uh, and safety differently specifically, which holds that the traditional safety thinking is very good, but the real issues happen when work demands exceed the work capacity. And, you know, that's really productivity because when workflow is easy, uh, you have the capacity to deal with the unexpected demands. So, um, and from there, we've, we've worked together at various areas that, um, yeah, it's been very, very uh, fruitful uh, collaboration. Awesome, awesome. Gary, did you want to fill in any gaps or contradict what Hendrik said? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, it was actually um, a delight meeting, meeting Hendrik because we started to talk about theory of the constraints and how, how far Elia Goldratt took it. And fortunately, he, he died way too early. And the thoughts were, well, when you talk about constraints, you do think about restraining construction, governance, as well as fixed constraints, like best practices or fixed constraints, processes are, are fixed constraints. I kind of introduced the notion, you know, that there are things called enabling constraints. They belong over in the complex system. So what the heck is that? And that over time kind of led us on to an interesting discussion where, you know, most of the projects that are done, particularly the major infrastructure ones, they're in what we call the order system. And uh, apologies for those folks that are on the podcast, but on, on the YouTube version, I, I've got a little background behind me. And I kind of put that up there just to show that there were really three basic systems in the real world, complex, chaotic, and order. And I know on previous podcasts, you know, this conversation about what is complexity has come up. So I thought, you know, as part of our banter, let's, let's talk about what's the difference between complexity and order. And order is great because it's stable, it's predictable, it's repeatable. We have if then cause relationships and we can do a lot of really cool stuff like get projects done. 
But then we have over in complexity, that's where the uncertainty that Hank talked about, unpredictability, ambiguity. Um, obviously you've heard of the term called VUCA. Yep. And I heard Al talked a bit about Cantor, right? So all, we all have these different terms for it. And I think we're all kind of singing out of the same hymn book. But what we're realizing that most of the work that we get done as humans is done in the order system. And thank God we can do that. But there are times when, no, we hit complexity. So we got to be able to do both and. And when you ask that question about our, comp, our project really complex or the ordered, it's all about the context. And there are some projects and mainly, um, like, like I mentioned in my bio, I did a lot of work in electrical utility construction. I would say 95% of my work was in the ordered system. Crews would get their orders, they'd go out, get the work done, do it safely, come back and we move on, which is great. But then you can get other industries or situations where it's totally complex. And one of the cool things down in Australia is what the Australian Department of Defense put out in 2012 was the differences between complex projects and what they call traditional. And the thing that always makes me smile is they kind of said, if you've got politicians involved, they're complex. <laughs> because you don't know what politicians are going to say and do. And do we have a really good example of that? Oh yeah, um, COVID-19. In Australia and New Zealand, you guys have followed the science, right? And the scientists are kind of saying, and, and the ministries of politicians are behind that. You lock down when you had to do lockdown and you kind of like, you flatten the curve. In other countries, Dale, and even, Bit like Canada, and of course, we're, of course, go to the US. We have the politicians trying to balance between, well, we got to keep things open to keep the economy going, but we got to, you know, and, and because of that, um, we've had a lot more fatalities than we should have, right? Now, who's right or wrong? I think maybe the history books 500 years from now will tell us who's right or wrong because it is so new in our face right now. We just don't really know and the science, and you want to believe the scientists by all means, but even the scientists are in the complex space because they're quite uncertain what we, they should be doing next. I mean, you go back to last February when it was like, ah, why do we need to wear masks? Why do we have to do this? And then you find out later that, well, you know, the COVID does transmit in the air and everybody starts getting mad at the scientists. Well, the scientists are learning as they go along as well. And this is what you, I've heard in other book broadcast um, podcasts, you talked about emergence. New stuff always arise, arrives. And that's why I think as good PM practitioners, you've got to be able, always be receptive and open when new information arrives. And that's what really kind of got us to looking at adaptive project management. Because in many cases, 90% of the time, you're in that order system and things are hunky-dory. But it's that 10% that really knocks you for a loop. And this is where Hank um, uses his theory of constraints to kind of look at where are those bottlenecks and what can we do about them? Now, the other word that we kind of use is sense-making as opposed to analysis, not saying either or, but in but analysis, we typically do a reductionist point of view. We, we look down. We have this ability to take things apart, look them at individually, fix them, and put them back together again. And that works really well in the ordered system. But you can't break things down in the complex system. Um, the analogy that I can use is how do you, you can break down Lego parts, order system, but how do you break down mayonnaise into its parts, into the salt, the vinegar? The answer is you can't, it's all entangled. It's, you just have to deal with the whole. And that requires a different level of thinking. And so in our adaptive project management, we want to tell managers, do you gotta know where you are in your current space? Is your project orderly and running well? Or if you hit some, complexity that you don't know what the heck is going on or some politician has changed their mind on you or some stakeholder 
or maybe the client's objectives have just shifted for whatever reason, right? If you will get mad and annoyed, but it's almost like that's what complexity is all about. And how do we deal? We, we can't reduce complexity. So how do we embrace it and how do we manage it? And Hank, that's what we kind of try to do in adaptive project management, right? awesome that's awesome my new saying is going to be when something's complex i'm just going to say that's mayonnaise um, yeah. <laughs> i think it's just got to stick that very project's good. just mayonnaise um very good right we, we let's let's jump into it um hendrik if we can just jump to you i know you mm. wanted to kind of just delve into a bit of the history of large projects and yeah what are some yes. of difficulties and complexities around achieving that you know that iron triangle the triple constraint traditionally and then that's how right. that brings us to today, just to set us up and let's get straight mm, into yeah. it, if that's okay. Perfect. So, you know, if, if we go, if we look at project management, which has probably been with us now for more than a hundred years, um, it's, it's interesting, uh, you know, there's the, uh, there's the elephant in the room, um, depending on who you talk to, uh, you will either hear that in the last 20 years, there's been no improvement in project productivity, like in large scale construction projects, or some people will say to you, well, there's been 1% a year every year. Now, uh, if you compare that to, uh, to areas such as manufacturing, I mean, manufacturing has had tremendous improvements in productivity. It's hit a plateau, but it's a very different environment. And uh, a good place to start would be to say, well, okay, uh, why is it so different? And, and just one more thing. I mean, I think in it was 2015, McKinsey's brought out a, 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 a write-up about large-scale construction mega projects, and I think they found that 98% of these projects uh, cost overrun, um, but the average uh, amount of the overrun was 80%, and the average slippage in the schedule was 20%. And the worst of these were were large infrastructure projects. My, uh, oil and gas did a bit better and mining on average did a little bit better uh, compared to that. But the infrastructure projects were absolute, it's like, it's like the teams running it had no control over it. Now, uh, you, you know, it's a, it's a very easy thing to, uh, to, to turn around and say, well, you know, the project teams, uh, they just weren't trained enough. Uh, they weren't experienced enough. They didn't, they didn't do their job well enough. And if I was there, I am sure I could have perhaps done it a little bit better. Um, but uh, it's never as simple as that. So, you know, there's a lovely little bit of work that PwC brought out, I think it was 2012, where they showed that as the percentage of the project management team that's been taught, um, well, if you just take the groups that have done these projects and you break them up from those, where 75% to 100% of the team had been trained in pr uh, classical project management techniques, like with a PM Bock, for example, um, and the others were not. You find that as the percentage of training exceeds 75 and gets to 100, things like the quality and the scope and, and, and those control aspects of the project improves very, very well. But the interesting part is that the... Uh, there's slippage on the cost and there's slippage on the, um, on the actual uh, uh, timing. Now, uh, the conclusion, I think, of that report was something along the lines that, uh, yeah, but if you look at the PM Bock, there's very little that's being trained on the actual execution. It's like 90% plus is all about the traditional control, how you scope, how you manage the risk but there's very little on the execution. And I think, I think it is true uh, that the execute, but I don't think it's an issue of training. I think it's something much more fundamental uh, than that. And, and the point is that if you, if you look at large projects, it's, they're drawn up from the point of view of, as Gary said, order of repeatability. So we know projects are different, but we do believe that we can, uh, can have a sequence of order in there. And the better we are and more experienced we are, the better we draw up that project plan. But the issue is that there's a 10% or 5% that's very, very critical. It's those unknown factors that come in and sabotage your project. The problem though is that 
our organizations, whether it's a project management or a big organization, it's a hierarchical structure. I mean, it's like in the army, you need to have a chain of command. Uh, otherwise, you know, the, 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 the troop will turn around, tell the corporal, no, I don't think I should take out that dangerous position over there. You, could, you should send somebody else. So the, so the instructions, the, the strategy, the plan is at the top uh, of the contract. It gets devolved down. The translation has some errors here and there, but in general, it works well to get the resources to the right area. But then when people start doing the work, very quickly they find that the work is imagined at the top and the work is done are two different things. But people have a, but there's an issue because all of us like to be seen as good at our job. So I'm not going to complain about every little thing that's not working. I understand that it's the expectation is that I will make do with what I've got. And most likely the management at the top had a good overview and they gave me what I needed. And also the issues that are developing are often in different parts. So in my department or my group of people working together, we can't see the bigger picture as to how these problems are developing. Um, and the managers two levels up or three levels up who have the resources and can, can make the adjustments, they just too far away to understand what's really happening there at the front line. So we have this asymmetry of information, downward flow, reasonably good. Upward flow, not good. I mean, how often have we heard a senior executive in court saying, I had no idea it was going on. And then everybody sniggers, but it's most likely the truth. They had no idea what was going on because the system, the system just naturally develops in a way that bad news won't travel upwards. Um, and, and you know, if you're a man manager in the front line, you might hope or believe that you can still call this project back. You can, uh, you can claw back what you've lost, it's like when people start doing illegal trading, you know, it's like, oh, I'll make a bigger bet and I'll make a bigger bet. At some point, I'm going to double or quits. At some point, I'm going to pull it back. So so we've got this uh, this problem in the asymmet asymmetry and um, there are many other problems also, but I think that's some of the main problems. Gary will add in a little bit more. So what... I found very useful is that um, if you go into a project and very often, by the way, you get called in because some senior executive have seen safety issues cropping up. They can see they've experienced enough to see that something isn't right. People are taking contractors are taking chances and then they call you in to come and look at the safety. And as you start going, you find out that it's actually work is difficult and contractors get paid for work that's done. So they also have an incentive to, to report that I've completed 50%, then I get paid 50% of the allocated number. So it's they, they incentivize to, 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 to ignore sort of the quality issues. People are going to go, especially if it's a built up environment with utilities, et cetera, the sequence starts to get extremely important. And if we go out of sequence, there's going to be a tremendous cost overrun. Uh, down the track, but it, the incentives are, are incorrect. And the people that really interested in that a few levels up, they don't know yet what's going on. So I found that when you go in and you break up the, you have interviews with people at the same level of seniority. So you look at the, talk to the engineers separate from the designers, separate from the frontline um, uh, uh, contractors, separate from the senior management uh, project team. And you just ask them, what makes this work difficult? Where, what's going on? Just tell me the stories of what's, what's busy happening. They start telling you what's happening. And if you listen for constraint, because Eli Goldratt said this, uh, if you have to summarize what theory of constraints is about, it's about focus. And I could add that it's focus around the constraints because there are only a few constraints that are the slowest step. If I uh, turn a bottle over, uh, the water has to go through the bottleneck. That's the shortest part. So in any system of work, there is one part at any moment that's the slowest part. And it doesn't matter how fast you work in the rest of the system, the work is going to stop and wait for that bottleneck to do its part. So if you can figure out where those bottlenecks are, and they can shift, right? At the beginning of a project, it might be in marshalling resources, getting the right skills, getting people... Near the middle of the project, it's, it's a construction project, very often you find if there's any design or engineering issues uh, and the actual work front getting out of sync, 
you very often find that that could be an area of a, uh, where bottlenecks develop. And of course, as people start doing more and more work on, on trying to catch up and make fix the mistakes, there's less and less time to go down and be at the pre-start meetings and make sure that the two parts of the work uh, connect and, and you get this vicious um, this vicious spiral. And then at the end of the project, you know, when it looks like everything is complete, it's just finishing off and uh, 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 and and making it all work properly, people get assigned to new projects, and the, uh, uh, and you can very easily create a constraint there on the finishing off on the um, uh, 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 on the completion of the project, which uh, is still very critical. But uh, we we continue around that. So so what we do is uh, what what we've done very often is to then look, listen to the stories that the people are telling. Uh, listen for an ear towards what are the constraints, what are the common things they're seeing from different levels in the organization. So if you understand a little bit about projects and the critical path and the integration points, what they say, it's, it's usually very quick to, to make sense of what's happening. And then you just draw it on a flow, a flow chart and you identify the few, one or two critical leverage points where if management goes and finds out more about that area, or they focus the effort and the resources over there, They'll address the bottleneck and the workflows. And we've had some really good success with that. But I have to say that there are one or two disadvantages with this method. The one part is it's a snapshot. You get to go in once. You, you form a picture of what's going. If you, uh, if you are practiced uh, in this sort of thing, you've seen similar situations before, you can probably draw up a very good flow chart. But there's a risk that you got it wrong. And then once management starts focusing on this leverage point and they start working there, the first question is, is it working? Because sometimes there's a two a month or two lag before the results start to come through. And the question is, uh, is it working? So if you think it's not working and you stop, you could be stopping just before you get that inflection point and the results come through. Um, and then also uh, as the project goes later, those bottlenecks, as you fix that area, of course, the work always moves to the next slower step. Uh, the next slower step becomes the bottleneck. Now, it might not be important, that bottleneck, but it could be quite important. And now the consultant isn't there to do the interviews again at all levels of the, uh, of the organization. And that's why we developed adaptive project management. Um, and the tools that Gary developed uh, for sense making in the world of complexity, we found that, they, that those are that you see they're very low cost, they're very easy to do. And I, I let Gary explain much better, but, but it solves these issues that I've just raised. So Gary, um, if it's yeah. fine, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, Gary, we'd love to hear from you now. What's, what's, this, what's this all about? Okay, um, <clears throat> so what Hank has talked about, I recognize, because I think we've all been in, in improvement meetings where we've gathered the troops together listen to them and we move on. But as, as Hank says, they're snapshots. So what if we made something really easy? And when I say easy, that's for everyone. Not only workers, it's for the project managers, the sponsors, the steering committee, anyone. And we use something that we're all really, really good at as, in, as in humans. We're natural storytellers. I mean, I look at your your podcast episodes, they're all about experiences told as stories. That's conversational, mm. really good at it. And if you look at it, that's how we pass our information and knowledge down from generation to generation. You know, you don't have your grandfather pull out a manual and says, okay, well, here are the family sort of things that I need to pass on to you. It's in stories, good and bad. When you look at Grimm's fairy tales or Aesop fables, what are they? They're just all lessons learned. Many cases, these are kind of like, don't eat the poison apple sort of messages, which is fine, but they do have an impression on the people going forward. What we have and Cognitive Edge has developed, and so this isn't something new. It's been going on for over 10 years. It's a piece of software that Dave Snowden created called SenseMaker. And essentially SenseMaker is just a way of collecting stories. So now we can go from where Hank is and having these little individual snapshot meetings to like, can we collect stories 24-7, 365 from anybody? And the answer is yes, because my God, 
the internet is in good enough state. We're, we're in cloud computing. We've got data visualization tools now. We can, we can harness all these things. So we can actually create a web link that any worker, project manager can have and they can enter their narrative. By narrative, it's just their impression of an incident that has just occurred, good and bad. And once they enter that, on the other side is the dashboard. It's the fact that we can actually see those stories being entered in real time. And the neat thing about um, complexity science is you look for the patterns. And one thing that anthropologists have found is that stories form patterns. So it kind of makes sense is that if everybody's talking about the same sort of thing, that is forming a pattern. Um, best example I've got is you've got the individual, Joe, that's working on a forklift, and the forklift is brand new and doesn't work for him. He may kind of like complain or not complain about it once. And as management, you don't know whether should I respond to that or should I not respond to it? Is he just kind of like, eh, complaining? But all of a sudden you find out from this database, there's 50 people complaining about this forklift. Does that grab your attention? Yeah, because all of a sudden, like, there is something that is raised on its own, very visibly, an issue that needs to be addressed. It's about forklifts. And that tells you, go like, does that happen to be a bottleneck that Hank has talked about that we need to address? So the fact that you always have current information about what's happening during the project, how valuable, how valuable is that? How often have we, you know, when I've talked to um, project managers, what keeps you awake at night? What keeps you awake at night is those problems that I haven't been able to solve. That's true. Because if you can solve those problems, eh, they're in the order system. Take care of them. Once you can't resolve, they're in the complex. Because maybe you don't quite know what the problem even is. Or you're dealing with what we call unknown unknowns or unimaginables or unknowables, all those kind of creepy things that are out there. So you need to engage the whole workforce, collect their with their collective wisdom. So I said, what's happening here, guys and gals? What do we need to look at so we can address this thing that's kind of hitting us? So we can do that, and it's pretty fast. In a previous podcast, you were talking about balanced scorecard, Dale. I kind of thought balance scorecard is a good idea and I've done lots of those, but it is kind of lag. So in terms of um, a baseball game, for example, the balance scorecard tells you at the end of the game, who won or lost. We can do better, we can do scoreboard. Oh, at the end of the fifth inning, this team is ahead of this team, it's four to three. So you get an idea of where you are, but I think where we really, really want to go to is dashboard. What is happening right now with the guy that's at the plate? What's the count? What's he up to? And particularly if you're driving a car, you want a dashboard with currently what's happening, all the information in front of you. Now, sensors are awesome. We actually have them in the mechanical electrical devices. So we know when machines are overloading because they'll tell us. Alarms will sound if things are boiling too hot. But what we need to now do, and we can, is that we need to engage humans as sensors. We actually have that spidey sense. And I always, you know, I'm a Star, Star Wars fan. So it's kind of like, I've got a bad feeling about this. You know, you know no sensor or machine picks it up, but I am gonna go, yeah, I got a bad feeling. So if you say that, now it allows you as a project manager to, to get ahead of the game. We get what we call this early detection. We get those weak, weak signals saying that, I think you better pay attention to this before it really goes off the rails. One of the really interesting examples is um, what we just saw in the Suez Canal. We had the ever give, given tanker block it. How does that impact a major infrastructure project, for example? I mean, most people would probably don't even think about it. But if you've got these human sensors, spidey people in your organization, they may be going like, do you realize that we're not going to get those pieces of steel and whatever, because that's in the container that's behind the one that ever given is blocked. What does that kind of mean? 
it allows the product manager to kind of go like, we got to get our heads together and figure this out. What is our contingency plans? Now, you did not in your initial risk estimation sort of stuff, think about that sort of an issue because it's unknowable, it's unimaginable. It just happens. So for all the best effort we try to do in risk estimation, it only can go so far. And when you look at risk, we often talk about risk in terms of known unknowns. We know about it, but we don't know when it's going to happen or how big it is. So we put probability against it in terms of severity right, and frequency. Well, what we got in the complex domain, we've got unknown unknowns, like I said. Well, they're not probabilistic. And if they do occur, typically they'll come as a surprise and they'll also come at a magnitude that you did not expect. You know, and the common term that we use is black swan or black elephant, if you want to use the, if you want to use the animal, animal menagerie. That's what we're trying to do to help project managers. And you know, honestly, to be honest with you, we're only talking about the project managers that are curious, that are really interested in knowing what is going on. Because I suspect like all project managers, like me as an engineer, I was lazy. I mean, like I only do so much to get by. So we're really looking for those managers that say, I, I'm really curious about what is going, what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And guess what? You can easily tap in to all the people that can share that with you and say, this is what's happening. So that you can make sense of it and go like, oh my God, I see a weak signal. Something's going to happen if we don't do something about it. That's great, Gary. And, and Hendrik as well. I, I was just listening in the background and just in awe. There were so many things to pick up there. And hopefully for the listeners, you know, the great thing with podcasts is there's a rewind button and you can listen to them in slow time. So I would, I would definitely recommend that. And specifically as well around the sense maker piece, that really, that really triggered my interest around, you know, not just the human sense piece, but kind of measuring and monitoring you know, patterns in, in narratives, because you're right. I think, I think project managers are great storytellers. They have to pull together so many different pieces of information. They have to influence, they have to chart, they have to make decisions on that. And nine times out of 10, all we are doing really in projects, and maybe this is part of the issue is we're looking at those balanced scorecards, those numbers that lag or don't provide us any kind of indicative interest in the future. And I guess one of the things that project managers always get charged with is, is the crystal ball method is you are, you are there to provide me certainty in the forecast of the future of this project. And somehow when they get it wrong, we're all shocked and surprised. And uh, I guess that's, that's really interesting. Your points there. Um, I do want to go kind of go into the detail though. So we did say this is about adaptive, adaptive project management. Um, how does that affect directly project delivery? I mean, if we could break it down into subsections, I know we have talked about it, but what is the correlation and what do you think would be the biggest bang for buck in terms of shaping and, and improving some of the project success rates? Because obviously we are, we've got some incredible stats that Hendrik rattled through before, which, which I think aren't going away because projects are getting more complex as we go on. What, what, can, what can we do to improve that or move the needle on delivery? Hank, you want to take that first and I'll follow up? Um, well, yeah, thank you, Gary. I'll just do it in very simple terms, and then I think Gary can flesh it out in much more detail. So um, so what Cognitive Edge developed years ago was something called SenseMaker, which was a fully-fledged program where people capture stories in, and that gets through to a kind of a dashboard where you look at contour maps and um, things start developing. But, of course, uh, you know, one of the issues is... Uh, if you are a project manager and you've already expended a lot of money to suddenly now budget for a, another big number is not the easiest of things to do. So um, th there's a stripped down version called Pulse that's very quick to do and um, it very effectively captures story. So for example, a great way of, the, the first point is that the that the tons and tons of reports and the wheelbarrows of reports that get generated uh, during a project, much of it isn't really read. And it's not read because also much of the information comes a, a little bit late. Um, you've already 
you know, it, it often just tells you what you, uh, what you already know. Now, if you, uh, a great way of incentivizing your people would be to say, look, um, instead of writing this report that you hate writing every week, why don't you just capture a few stories, just write a few paragraphs of what's making your area of work difficult or things that you've seen. Just, just capture this for us. And when you, when you then um, have this information coming and you ask this person to just signify on three axes, for example, you can see that in the background that Gary has got there, but just signify for us, where would you put this story? Is it something to do with difficulty of work, something about safety? Where, where, do, you, where do you think it fits in? And when, when this all comes through on this dashboard, what you have is a developing uh, day by day or week by week, you have a contour map where certain peaks are starting to develop, and it and it tells you uh, it it tells you that something dynamic is happening inside your organization. So because the stories capture the culture, it capture what people it captures what people are talking about. So it immediately uh, highlights to you as a manager: as, I have only X amount of hours in the day. Where should I go and spend my time? What should I maybe find out a little bit more of? Um, and as I say, in, in, in construction projects that are, for example, light rail or hospitals that are already operating where all the services are on top of one another and people, uh, this, uh, people get in each other's way and making a mistake has got tremendous consequences for the rework, et cetera. You mm. will most likely find patterns of a certain kind developing where in other environments, uh, more open, the traditional road building, you'll find them uh, typically developing other, in other areas. But again, the, what we talked before was you are worried about those, uh, um, about those hits to the system that, that affect the bottleneck. And when something starts to slow down, maybe it's just the, the technical debt that's starting to build and you don't know about it. You're going to find out about it, but you're going to find out when the cost is already baked into the cake where you could do nothing about it. And this is, this is the kind of guidance that we're talking about. And when you, what this also does is it changes the conversations that you have at the project meeting. You're starting to, you're starting to have discussions about what's coming down the track. You're not talking about what went wrong and who's responsible and what are we going to do to you so you don't do it again. I mean, that's uh, the, the, we use the example of a captain standing on the at the back end of the ship, which got a name, I'm sure. Is it the is it the stern <laughs> standing? And he yep. and he analyzes the wake of the ship coming past, uh, versus standing at the front and saying, "We're going in that direction. Everybody align. This is that's where we will do the attack." It's a totally different uh, frame of mind, and that's why we call it adaptive, because there's mm. an iceberg turn. Turn, turn to port 30 degrees immediately. Um, that's a totally different way of managing your project from, oh dear, what pieces of ice are coming past the, uh, coming past the back here now? Who's responsible? Um, and, and that's the benefit. And I think that's what Gary, what Gary can... Um, so, so it's a map. So it provides yeah. a map uh, uh, of the future of some uncertainty. It's still uncertain, but it's much less uncertain then you waiting for certainty. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Gary, I'll, I'll hand yeah. over to you. Right. So what I've shown you my background here is the dashboard. This is a real time live dashboard. And if somebody were to enter a story, each story there is a dot that has the ability to actually reshape those contours. And the nice thing about this is that we can actually do time shots. So we can say, what is the map look like this week? compared to what did the map look like two months ago. And that's how we kind of monitor as well, how we making progress. Because this, the change intervention question becomes, where do we want fewer stories, like in that red X here, which is not where we want to be? And how do we get more stories over the green checkbook? And typically we're in front of PM decision makers. We don't give recommendations, we can just um, pose that question and they will know, oh, this is because of this rule, this standard, or this policy, or way. And we say, that's great. That's where then we need to go look at 
to kind of see how can we shift how those stories are going. Now, the other power of SenseMaker is the ability to really go down to the actual source. So if you were to click on a dot, you can actually bring up the story that was shared or whoever entered the story. So you can read it because that's the context. In big data, we get the who, the what, the where, the why, or, but we don't get the why question answered. The why question has context. This is what Trisha Wang, ethnographer, called thick data. What we call it in Cognitive Edge, Dave Stoner calls it, is rich data. Why? Because we get a whole pile of real narratives that we can look at to make sense of the situation. That's the real thing about, and we also have the nice ability of talking about psychological safety without having to talk about psychological safety. Why? Because everybody can enter a story anonymously. And when I say anybody, I'm including the project manager who wants to enter a story saying, well, my superior just did this and express his concerns and issues about that as well. And it could be a board member entering a story as well saying, why am I always getting this sort of bar charts which don't tell me anything? Well, the difference between the bar charts typically, which are Likert scales surveys and the bar chart you're seeing in the top left corner, if I click on the bar chart, all the stories that make up the bar chart show up. So you can actually read them and go like, oh my God, is this is what really is happening on the ground floor or wherever in the whole organization. So it gives you, again, a lot more way of looking at the data and slicing and dicing it as well. That is awesome. I, I love the analogy of the, 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 the scoreboard. Um, and it might, it'll sound like I'm making this up, but literally yesterday I was out walking and I was thinking, you know what, we need something like a cricket scoreboard. And for anyone that knows cricket, it's extremely boring, but I love a test match. It's over five days, right? <laughs> but you can turn on the TV at any one of those days and you see the scoreboard, the scorecard, whatever you want to call it. And you know exactly what's happening in the match, right? Because it's live, the yeah, data's yeah. there, it gives you the full context, um, and cricket is complex as well. Um, a lot of people don't like it, don't understand and find boring because of its complexity. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, but I love the analogy there, Gary, on the, the scoreboard. Um, I just had a couple of comments as well around, is there uh, this notion that um, complexity is somewhat skewed because people might look at the value of a project or the size of people on a project and say it's complex. It, it, is, is that sort of a, 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 a wrong way to look at it? And is this often what executives look at and go, oh, it's costing you know billion pounds or dollars. Henceforth, it's a complex project. And that 100K one is a simple one. Is that something that we fall into a trap of one? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, I was just wondering, you mentioned adaptive project management a lot. And I was starting to think, well, in order to steer your team based on the icebergs coming um, analogy, we need to create agility. So how do we then create that agility? Because that isn't a natural thing for everyone, particularly if you on an oil tanker, that's really difficult to move. So I wonder if you have some insight into that. And then just a third one, just to throw it up and make this a really complex question. <laughs> uh, you see what I did there? Um, a lot of what you're saying, just to clarify, this requires data input. And is this someone sitting at a computer or multiple people, everyone sitting and typing in what they're doing? Or on a previous podcast where Val went, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a Siri listening into the room, collecting all of the conversation and it automatically forming it and putting it into this dashboard. So I know there's a lot built into that question there, but let's go stick with you, Gary, first. And then Hendrik, maybe you can follow up after that. Yeah. I will answer questions one and three and I'll let um, you talk about agility. Okay, mm -hmm. and stability. Yeah, I'm happy to well, do that. Let me start by the last question, number three is again, we want to make it easy for people. And what we make it easy is that if you're a person in the field, you actually can have the SenseMaker app on your phone, on your device. So you don't have to be keyboarding in, which is really difficult. 
you can actually do a voice recording. You can take a photo to capture what is happening and what you want to talk about at a particular time. Typically, it's some sort of decision that you're going to make. So you take a photo or a voice record that. And a lot of people are going, well, why a voice recording? Well, it's because we're sense making. We're more interested in the patterns that have been formed going up at the system. Now, if you want the detail of what's the context, click on the dot and you can listen to the voice recording. In fact, we recommend to decision makers, look up, don't look down. Because as soon as you go looking down, people are going like, well, who said that? What, you know, and there, you know what happens, the blame thing kicks yeah. in. Yeah. So we say, no, let's stay up because you start blaming this person, this person, and all of a sudden like, you blame 40 people. What does that tell you? It's not really the people, it's the system. So we wanna keep them up there but you always have the ability to go back down. So again, it's making it simple for that. Um, the first one is we often get mixed up with something that's really big as being complex. No, it could be just really, really complicated. Good example is that if you're going to build um, a, new, a new jet plane, that's complicated. If you're going to, it's a lot of engineering projects are complicated. What's complex? It's being a kindergarten school teacher. Why? Because you have no idea what those little kids are going to be doing. Kids are what we call dispositional. But that means you think they're going to behave this way, but you don't know if they will or not. Why? Because of emotion, because most of us make decisions emotionally. We're not rational decision makers. We're not, little kids aren't going like, I think I will kind of like do a must and want sort of uh, rational decisions here and objectively, you know, pick my choices. No, they react emotionally. Most of us do that as humans. Why? That's because it's easy to do and it's fast to do. So kindergarten schooling is complex. Why is building an aircraft quite complicated? Well, because you've got an idealistic future state. You know what the plane's gonna look like at the end. You can build a nice linear roadmap, put in all these different phases and stages, put all the milestones and KPIs in. And you also can really track that because if you know if you start to deviate, oh, we're off the rails, what can we do to fix it to get back on track? And you can measure that. So we measure in the ordered system with, with, with being complicated, we can only monitor it's over in the complex. Okay, does that help there? Yeah. Okay, mm. okay. Um, Hendrik, do you wanna talk about yeah. stability agility. and agility? Yeah, yeah. So um, if, you, uh, if you think of a project and there's an issue that's starting to develop um, it's, uh, to be agile, your team now has to shift energy and everybody has to add 20% of their um, activities or, or their time during the day. They actually have to focus on trying to sort in their waking and almost not waking moments. They have to have some focus on this particular area. Um, if they were to do that, it's very likely that you will have a that your team would be considered agile. You look at the results and say, yeah, I had an agile team on this project. The first problem is normally, we don't know where this issue is that we need to be agile around. The second one is if we, if some of us know, not all of us agree that this is the issue. And after we agree that this is the issue, there's also some of us disagree as to the way that we should actually be dealing with this. Um, so there's a, a whole lot of things and, and some people will actively not do what we as the manager maybe think should be done because they don't see the problem the way that we do. Now, one of the things that I've seen very clearly is when you have these story examples and uh, let's, say, let's say you're in a project management team, there's an issue that's starting to come up. The, 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 the most powerful way of making the team, the top team work together around this issue is when you confront them with the stories three or four or five from
from people that are working around that issue. Uh, and there's some amazing stories about, you know, people uh, heartfelt, emotionally stating the misery that they're in because of certain things that are just not working. So one person says it, maybe it's the person. Two people say it, maybe we employed a lot of bad apples. Five people say it, it's like, oh dear, I've seen this thing before. This is, this is something big. And that emotional connection with, oh dear, there's something... There's something going on here. We better do something. This is going to be a problem. That is your, that's the best way of getting the uh, alignment uh, of the team going in that certain direction. The next part is once you start working at that, if you don't at least see some uh, success uh, in addressing that issue within a few weeks or so, the energy is going to go. Your, your alignment is going to disappear. You need to have that positive feedback loop. Now, typically, you will choose this area to focus on based on the stories that are coming through and your knowledge that it's actually a bottleneck that you're working on. And anytime that you do work concentrated from different areas on the bottleneck, you see the result immediately in the stories that are being told and in the results that are flowing from that. So in a way, if you do it that way, it almost becomes the easiest thing ever. I mean, I've seen this so many times. It's, it's like you're running a project, but you're not managing anyone because they're doing what needs to be done because they know and they feel deep in their hearts that this is a thing that needs to be done. They can see the results. And as the right things start to happen, you can see the contour maps changing. You can see the monthly results uh, changing. And there you have your adaptability and alignment. It's the easiest it's the easiest way of doing it. If you try it in another way and, and you change any of those factors, it's the hardest thing. And you will, uh, you will be bitching to your family at home about how difficult this group of people are and how they just don't want to work together and they like a herd of cats. And if it wasn't for you, nothing would be happening, et cetera, et cetera. That's awesome. I love the herding cats. It never gets old. We're always herding cats. Val, uh, as we head into the final part of the podcast, any any final questions for you? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's great. It's been it's been very educational. I did want to talk about though those that were already underway. So you're already an established project manager. Uh, I find on projects sometimes, you know, it's you know the it's already left the gate. It, we've already started the project and we're in that delivery phase. And you know, we talk about continuous improvement a lot on projects. And I find a lot of the time where, you know, we're talking back to herding cats, we're continuing, continually improving something that's already broken. We're not actually fixing the fundamentals of that system. And that's because it's complex. Again, it's like putting Lego in the mayo and that's not going to be good for anybody. So how then does someone who's already an established project manager decide to become an adaptive project manager? That's a, that could be a new, for some of those listeners, a new skill set, a new mindset, as you put it. How do they go from regular Joe to adaptive project management extraordinaire. Um, Hendrik, I might start with you if you've got any insights there. Well, they call us, of course. <laughs> 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 no, so look, I mean, it is, it's a mindset. And um, uh, one of the fascinating things is that Eddie Goldratt mentioned when he uh, wrote his book, The Goal. Um, he wrote of so many cases where people read the book, they decided they had a painful issue and they went and they tried various things that he recommended and they got the results and sometimes better. So there's absolutely nothing uh, after hearing what we've discussed. It's not, it's nothing of what we said is rocket science. It's mm. just really, it's, if you think of it, it's really simple, simple things. It's just being open to the fact that not everything is ordered. Not everything can be scripted. Not everything can work well through the command and control chain. We must have it. I mean, <laughs> I would certainly not recommend that you get rid of that. That would be a disaster. But we need to augment. So, so keep what's good and add the bits that you're missing. And, and, and the bits that are missing is having some, having a, shall we say, uh, 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 um, having something that tells you at the earliest moment possible what's busy happening and what's busy changing. So you can be the captain at the front uh, and, not, and not at the stern of the ship and, and reacting. Because once you are going to reaction mode and you, I mean, then your meetings take forever. They, 
dissatisfactory because it's complaints, it's blame. It changes absolutely zero about what's going to happen tomorrow. So if, if you just have your meetings like we are going to have them forward focusing, we want to go in that direction. I mean, if, if you can get to that point where I know we want to go there, the rest actually becomes easy. That's, yeah, that's Gary. my contribution. Gary? Yeah. Gary? Our, starting point, our starting point advice would be, where's your map? Do you really know what current reality is from the people that are actually impacted by this particular project? I think we should some, collect some stories and build us a map because if we're gonna to navigate to some sort of a project vision end, we need a map to kind of figure out where are those hills and those valleys that we're going to, to encounter. Let's kind of build that particular map and start from there. Now, just so I can quickly point out my little visual in the back there, this is the Kinevin framework. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but the Kinevin framework that Dave Snowden developed is really coming from the three systems order where he split into complicated and clear, and we have the complex and the chaotic. The question that I always get asked is, well, what role should I play as a project manager? And their answer is, you get to play many roles, depending on the context of today. Typically, you're going to be in a complicated domain. Why? Because you're an expert. You kind of know how to run projects. And hopefully, you stay there 90, 95% of the time, and things are kind of boring, and they just work. That's where you're achieving, and you're just you know, moving right along. You've got your workers on the front line asking you questions like, Dale, why do you here? Well, that's where you put on that expert hat, and that's where that you play as well. But then there are times like, oh my God, we're, we're hit by something. I don't understand what this is. Or the politicians have just kind of like, they just locked us down, whatever. What do we do with that? Your role then is to put on a catalyst and kind of going, I think we need to engage some more folks to understand this. But when you go into the complex domain, you're no longer in kind of in a command and control. You're more into a synergist facilitating role. You're really there to be, and I've heard the word of many, but I guess a humble sort of person. Listening, you know, using the two ears that um, nature gave us, opposed to the one mouth, and listening to find out because chances are it's the folks that, that are in the organization that really know what's going on anyways. Why wouldn't you want to listen to them? Mm -hmm. And that's what we call the red loop. You're constantly in a loop, depending where it is. And that's why my question always would be at a starting point is, where are you in the red loop? Now, if it is so bad and things are so off rails, you may have to go into the blue loop. If you look at blue loop, you actually do a shallow dip into chaos. This is sometimes we call disruptive innovation, but you may have to <clears throat> blow things apart because people are so tightly holding on to their old paradigms and views, they can't shake that away. We have to help them to let go so they can join in and, and explore and be creative and co-create with the rest of us, right? So this is a very dynamic stuff. Adaptive project management is very, is very dynamic as well. Mm. No, they're great insights and I appreciate that. I mean, this is the first time as well, I think I've seen, um, you know, just storytelling mapped out um, with some type of topology or, or contour lines. I thought that was a really interesting way to demonstrate that. So if anyone's not seeing these pictures, I highly recommend uh, either checking the YouTube channel out or, or going to your website. But it's really, really interesting. Dale, over to you, mate. Thank you, Val. I also find it fascinating, uh, Gary. I love that you've given us some bonus bits with your change of background there as we've gone through. So as Val says, check out YouTube if you do want to check out some of the visuals there. They, they are pretty cool. But again, you can also get in touch with Gary and Hendrik on LinkedIn. So um, And there's websites we'll post in the show notes as well. Gentlemen, this brings us to a special part of the podcast. It's our feature it's called Defend the in Indefensible. Oh. Um, before we get into it, uh, we will let Val go. He needs to go put his makeup on and get ready for his day. So Val, we'll let you go. Thank you very much for your, your time. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. It's been an absolute pleasure. Let's keep in touch. Thank you. Uh, we'll do that. So off you go, Val, to put your yeah. makeup on and your lipstick and have a fantastic day. Um, so yeah, Defend the Indefensible. 
uh, it is inspired by some of the ridiculous statements we hear every day. And for this, I'm going to hand over to our in-house guru, Mr. Martin Curriston, because he's going to give you a ridiculous statement and you have to defend it for 30 seconds. So Martin, uh, seri welcome. seriously, or uh, seriously, or just as a joke? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can decide depending on what he goes okay, into. All right. All right. <laughs> Yeah, um, thanks, Dale. Yeah, as, as Dale said, um, we, we're trying a little feature where, where we defend a ridiculous statement for 30 seconds. So if you're both ready and keen, um, let's make a start. Um, I'll do one each in, in the interest of, of fairness, um, starting with Gary. So if you're ready, you have mm -hmm. yeah. 30 seconds to defend the following statement. Chaotic projects are the best type of projects to work on. They're just more exciting than, than the ordinary <laughs> ones. Discuss. Yeah, I, chaos is great because it means total freedom. You can go anywhere you want and or maybe break a few rules, maybe break the law. Let's do an insurrection. Who knows what's going to come out of insurrection? Maybe we'll get a better democ democratic system because we broke down the barriers. Brilliant. <laughs> Very convincing, that. That's, Very good. <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, Hendrik, on to yours. So you have 30 seconds to defend this statement. As a project manager, how can I be expected to account for unknowns when I know what I'm delivering? Discuss. OK, so as a project manager, how can I be? Just repeat that one again, please. How can I even be expected to account for unknowns mm -hmm. in my pledge plan when I know what I'm delivering? All right. Okay. Um, well, that makes imminent sense to me because we're obviously working in projects where uh, thousands of projects like this one has been done before. So uh, what is this issue around uh, uh, unknowns? I mean, everything is known. So um, I, I think uh, that the question is a, is a strange one because we know what we're doing. We've been doing it thousands of times. Um, there's nothing new really under the sun. Nothing that can surprise me. I'm expert. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks a lot. Thanks for being uh, Chris Fox. That is awesome. A little bit of fun at the end there, Hendrik and Gary. And thank you for <laughs> being good sports and, and, and taking part in that. Uh, as we head into the end of the podcast, uh, I'll come to each of you just for your final thoughts, perhaps, that you want to leave the listeners with. Gary? Yeah. Um, one thing about complexity is don't think you can reduce it. Every time you actually create a new relationship, your complexity goes up. It's kind of like we just got more dots to connect. So if somebody says to you, or a consultant says to you, a big consultant says to you, or we're going to reduce complexity, what they're saying is, okay, think about relationships that you guys have. Which one do you plan to ignore or try to cut? Well, by the way, you may want to try ignore and cut it, doesn't say that the other person is going to ignore it and cut it, and they may come back and bite you later when you least expect it. So always be aware, complexity is always on the rise. Complexity is always on the rise. I love that. Hendrik, any final thoughts from yourself? Yeah, Dale, uh, I think um, I'd like to talk about, you know, we live in a world of technological breakthroughs and IT and artificial intelligence, and there's always pressure on projects and project managers. Are you using this software? Are you using that software, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, look, I've seen in my career, especially around mining industry, that if the fundamental model or your framework of what you think is happening and how you make sense of the world, if that is not in touch with what actually is happening, more software will put you in deeper trouble much faster. So, so there's much more to gain by just understanding what's happening, capturing in what's available in people as sense maker. Uh, a sense makers, um, understanding when you're in the audit, understanding when somebody come, something comes from a little bit outside, and then adapting uh, people to that by creating an environment where they can deliver and align and, and adjust. Um, it's not that software is unimportant, but it's not going to make the breakthrough that we've seen uh, getting the productivity to jump 15% a year or anything like that. In fact, We've seen in mining that it actually can go the opposite way. Um, so that's my that's my nugget for the end. No, brilliant. Thank you for that nugget. Um, and I agree with that because if you just look at the past 
5, 10, 15 years, we have had a lot of technology, yet we're still mm. working these crazy hours, right? Um, it should mm. it should have actually shortened our weeks to two, two days a week by now, but yet it hasn't. So yeah, I think the evidence is there. For me, if there's one thing I will take away from all of this is mayonnaise. Um, <laughs> so make sure that your project <laughs> is not mayonnaise. But thank you, gentlemen. It's been an absolute blast. Um, thank you for giving up your time and sharing your wisdom. It's been fantastic. Uh, we thank do need much. to keep in touch and um, we'll, we'll, we'll stay in contact. Thank you so much. Yep. Just before we go, we have one more surprise, if you're up for it. It's a pop quiz called Tenor. Ten questions and answers, quick fire questions and answers, so it won't take too long. And you should know the subject matter very well. For this, I will hand to Martin to take you through your paces. Yeah, thanks, Estelle said it. Nothing um, quite as, as complex as what we've been talking about there. Now, uh, ten questions, all about yourself, quick fire. So if you're ready, let's, let's make a start. Uh, We'll start with Gary first and then Hendrik in terms of order. So, okay, number one. Gary, what's your morning routine? Oh, first thing when my iPhone alarm goes off, I automatically kind of check um, what's important emails, reminders, then go downstairs at breakfast and kind of start reading the news. Great, Hendrik? Coffee and reading the news, uh, it's a, nice. uh, uh, preferably YouTube. I mean, I find, I find YouTube pretty good. <laughs> it's a new source of news in 2021. Uh, number two, would you rather spend your day with people or technology? Gary. You know, people and technology are so entangled. Um, <laughs> I don't have a priority in order. It's essentially what I first thing I read on the email. If it's technology, it's fine. If it's something about people, I just go with it. Yeah, no preference. I, I love technical people. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great cop I, out. <laughs> uh, I, I actually, I, I do. I look, I mean, I, if I'd be honest, if I have to recharge a little bit, it's, uh, it's uh, with technology and by myself, but uh, there's nothing like uh, fascinating discussions with uh, technical people and the challenge your, um, your views, etc. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Uh, next, how do you deal with stress? Well, for me, it's uh, physically getting outside, depending on the weather. Um, if the weather is nice, um, it's golfing, it's biking. If it's crappy weather, then I'll be inside squash. But my latest um, addition to my um, office has been a walking treadmill under the computer desktop. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not walking right now as I'm talking to you because I'm not bobbing, but I could be. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting. Andrew? Yeah, so for me, it's definitely running. Um, I do notice when I start to get unfit and then also um, some meditation. When I do do it, it works really well. <laughs> oh, wow. Quite a few of our guests have been into meditation. Yeah. It's quite, quite an interesting yeah. theme here. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Okay, next, what's the best book you've been gifted? Hmm. Well, 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 for me, I'm... Um, in fact, in 2007, we took a family Mediterranean cruise. And at Christmas, Christmas time, our daughter gave us the gift. And it was an Apple book from all the photos that she took. Just a wonderful memory. And, um, you, know, you know, 15 years later, I'll open up and it just brings back all those really fond memories. Oh, that's really nice. That's a... Yeah. So, so for me, it was Peter Singhi's The Fifth Discipline. I, I think Peter was way ahead of his time um, and very much around the order and systems thinking, but that was my, that was my introduction to the world of systems thinking. Interesting. I'll just make a note of that. I see Dale's doing the same there. Um, <laughs> okay, next. If you could choose to spend a day with anyone, past or present, who would it be and why? Yeah, okay. There's a bit of a vacuum in my family history. I, I heard a lot of what my, what my grandfather did um, when he first arrived in Canada back in the turn of the 1900s, but I never got to meet him. So there's a gap there for me, which I would love to fill, just spend a day with my grandfather saying, how did you help all those other people that were coming in from Canton, China, get settled into Canada? Because he was a conduit to help them get settled. And there's real, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of stories that are contained 
from what he could tell me. Definitely. So, so Nathan. Ooh, that's, uh, that, that, that's a difficult one. I think uh, I'd like to meet the tiller the Hun because he's so misunderstood. No, I, I don't think so. Uh, uh, no, no, perhaps not. Perhaps not. Perhaps not. You know, um, cosmology has always been a, a great interest of mine. And uh, it seems that he's still alive but sir roger penrose has got some fascinating ideas about the universe the end um uh, what was what came before and also um and also in consciousness uh, yep. just a very quick aside he believes that that the brain is a quantum computing device not a linear processing machine and therefore he's not very hopeful about efforts at artif artificial intelligence with the infrastructure that we've got at the moment and uh, it's fascinating, uh, absolutely fascinating. I, I don't think I'll understand most of it, but I'm, I'm hoping that my third year physics will at least help a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that goes back to what you said there, don't rely on technology to, uh, to help you out in the short term. Yeah. Uh, brilliant. Um, yeah. What's the best piece of advice you've been given? Oh, I guess um, in terms of my career, it was my first job as a district manager at this electric utility. I was taking a lunch by two senior fellows and they said, oh, Gary, for the first six months, just be a sponge. I know you're full of piss and vinegar. You want to go and change the world. Just be a sponge. And it was the best advice I got, Warren, because all those ideas that I had in the back of mind mm -hmm. I wanted to do, the fellows already had them. So when they, I just enabled them to implement them and I gave them the credit for it and I got what I got. Yeah, so, so, so my advice, uh, I don't think it was given, but I, I read it as part of a book that I was writing. And there was this lady uh, that interviewed uh, uh, best people on strategy. And, and one of the interviewees uh, mentioned and said that humans are feeling creatures that think. They're not thinking creatures that feel. And, and when you understand that, uh, the world makes a lot more sense because uh, what we're seeing is the fight for feeling, feeling that's overwhelming thinking, and uh, and and we need both, and both of them are there. But but the order, we are feeling creatures that think. It's not the other way around. That's quite interesting. Huh? I like that one. That's uh, very good. <laughs> um, yeah, please think about that one still. Um, okay, next. <laughs> um, what's the biggest mistake you've made on a project? Oh, oh, okay. Um, it goes back to my days when I was with the big consulting company and we were in the project proposal stage. We had actually got to the point where we were negotiating and it was a large government project. And we thought that we were dealing with the decision makers. Well, oops, we lost the bid and found out later that the winning competitor was dealing higher up at the political level making promises they couldn't deliver. <laughs> yeah, so, so a similar one in our example um, is that there were some big government cro cro projects that came up uh, um, for tender, and we went to great trouble taking the representatives through everything that we did, et cetera, et cetera, and we really made an effort of it, and I think we did a really great job. And in the end, all the business went to a person that imported every last bit of material from another country. And all they wanted to do, there was, there was collusion going on. All they wanted to do was figure out how, how it actually works. And, and that's what we provided them. So uh, yeah, that was a, that was a complexity mistake in not understanding the motives and not understanding the situation that we were dealing with. It's important. I know, know your stakeholders. That's the, that's the key thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Um, okay, next. Almost, almost there now. Uh, what advice would you give your 10-year-old self? Oh, okay. 10-year-old self. Well, I think it would be be trustworthy. So people will learn how to trust you. You cannot go up to a person and say, trust me. That's a choice that that other person will make. So how do we do that? Well, I think you've got to build character, Gary. In other words, be honest, um, be humble, keep promises, and also build a really good set of competency skills. Definitely. Mm. Mm. 
Well, this is a this is a really uh, this is a really tricky one um, because you know I, I I think in a way your life develops in a way based on the experiences that you've had, and um, I I once heard somebody say that it's amazing this new job I had it's perfect I mean I've worked at three different companies before and they each perfect for this position isn't it perfect that I got this job and I'm thinking. No, you got the job because you had the three companies that you worked for before and it showed up in your CV. <laughs> so, um, so, so in a way, I think, uh, I think one shouldn't stress too much uh, about, you know, the direction that you go as long as you're always learning and it's, uh, and it's interesting. I think what I might do is perhaps to have tried to specialize in the direction a little bit earlier but I'm not so sure if that would have been much better because, uh, again, we wouldn't have been sitting here because uh, my my point of my development of my career to where we are sitting here today, I think needed all of the detours that I did out of a point of curiosity and boredom. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Uh, next, what profession other than your own would you like to have attempted? I probably would have become an accountant. Um, I was good at the numbers. Um, I, I can move paper around, I'm good at spreadsheets. It probably would have ended me up where I am today. But instead of um, having an engineering background, um, but an MBA, I would have become an accountant. But I don't think an accountant can go back and take engineering. So I'm glad, kind of glad I went the route that I went. Engineering first has a background. Yeah, it definitely opens more doors. <laughs> I I would have uh, I would have become a, a, a investor, but not a not a fund investor working for a big company, a total contrarian investor, because um, I I've seen all the big trends, I've seen them early, I haven't made any money out of them. <laughs> <laughs> we lost Martin there. Uh -oh. you back, Martin? Enough. Um, back. Okay, oh, last one. Uh, sorry, <laughs> apologies. Back, back in the room. Um, last, last question. Uh, if you had a million dollars to spend in a day, what would you spend it on? Is that in a day or per day? In a day. In a day. Oh, I thought. Okay. Um, well, I guess number one is a um, million dollars in a day. Well, I guess you know. First thing that comes to my mind is. I'm worried that somebody is going to close to me is going to get kidnapped and held for ransom because they want that million dollars. So I'd probably need to set up some, some sort of a trust fund, <laughs> stick the money in there with the stipulation that money can't be used to pay off a ransom. Then I got some time I can think about. <laughs> and I would I would take that money and I would invest it in some way as the bulk as opposed to buy something for some simple pleasure. <laughs> so very orderly. Hmm. <laughs> that's very orderly. <laughs> uh, that, that's a that's a really tricky question. Uh, I think I'll, I, I I think uh, uh, as the one guy said, I think I'll buy a pair of shoes and the rest I'll just blow. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That is awesome. <laughs> Preferably on fast cars and uh, and and drink and women and uh, yeah. <laughs> sensible answers. All sensible answers, and we do have a disclaimer at the end to say that you know all these thoughts are your own, Hendrik. They don't belong to any organisation that you belong to. So, <laughs> no, fantastic. Thank That's you great. so much for being such good sports. It's amazing and a bit of fun just to finish off the podcast, folks. That is all we have time for on this episode but it doesn't have to stop here. Support our charities, access blogs, or if you think you have something awesome to share, visit projectchatterpodcast.com. Don't forget to hit subscribe on our YouTube channel and your favorite podcast player so you don't miss the next one. A massive thank you to Hendrik Lawrence and Gary Wong, and thank you all for listening. A special shout out also to Keith Farrell for putting us in touch and making this podcast happen today. Till next time, we say stay safe, be disruptive, and have fun doing it. From me, Val, and Martin, it's bye for now. Goodbye.